he did. That was very unpatriotic. So for a change, we we'll start with time. Um, and again, I need to um, uh, mention that uh, we have to practice affirmative action for men because it looks like we have only one man. Uh, and uh, Jason Dexter, that we speak today, and uh, three women. So we are all happy about that. Um, uh, we just heard an excellent uh, talk by uh, Euron Young, uh, who will speak in a few minutes. Uh, we we'll start with Lexley Berger, our own Einstein fellow, and she will talk about the multi-phase view of turbulence uh, in the Perseus and molecular cloud. And after that, we'll hear from Euron Young, uh, she's visiting us from Daisy. Uh, in Germany, uh, and she will talk about atomic alignment, a promising magnetic diagnostic in diffuse media. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Mara McLaughlin uh, from West Virginia, the <coughs> CFA colloquium today, uh, working on a very exciting frontier. There were more than four or five papers over the past few weeks on it, and parts of timing array uh, are putting very tight limits on black hole binaries. In fact, uh, out to 100 megaparsec, one can already set limits on binary companions to some uh, supermassive black holes in our vicinity. And she will talk about the first uh, fast radio burst discovered with the Green Bank Telescope, completely different um, And then uh, Jason uh, Dexter, from, that is visiting us from MTE, uh, will talk about missing pulsars in the galactic center. Thanks. All right, thanks, Avi. Um, so I like to consider myself an observationally motivated theorist, and I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about a recent paper that myself and my collaborators have published on really investigating the nature of the multi-phase uh, gas in the Perseus molecular cloud towards understanding what, uh, how we can better quantify and understand the H1 to H2 transition. That's really where the multi-phaseness of this project comes in. Now I said I'm an observationally motivated theorist, so I'd like to start with this kind of cartoon picture that all the theorists love about the three-phase ISM. So the general idea is that you have some sort of hot ionized medium with temperatures around 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 Kelvin. And then embedded in this hot ionized medium, you have warm and cold clouds. So this is a warm, neutral, and cold neutral medium that are traced by the 21 centimeter line. And then further embedded in the cold uh, neutral clouds, you have um, molecular clouds that are shielded. And this shielding from the H1, the cold H1, allows this transition between H1 into the molecular H2. And of course, this is a, where we have star formation. Now, this is a very idealized cartoon, so I like to think of this as just a happy theorist land. Unfortunately, this idealized cartoon is actually uh, no observer would agree with, with this picture at all. In fact, we have a much more complicated picture of the uh, life cycle of gas in galaxies. So atomic gas, of course, at some point transitions into the molecular phase, but really this is a very big bottleneck process, both in terms of our theoretical understanding and also how we can trace this observationally. Eventually, the molecular gas will form into stars, and stars will then evolve on their, on their life cycle and eventually release um, energetically and also their gas back into this process. And so really this whole process is not well understood, but especially this transition between the H1 to H2 it remains mysterious for a number of good theoretical reasons. Um, there's a lot of very complicated physics involved um, in the atomic and molecular uh, gas transition. So, of course, the gas is supersonic, it's turbulent, it's magnetized, it's not spherical cal, so we have fractal type structures. Um, there's the unknown UV field, and of course it's partially ionized, and the ionization, especially in the denser parts of the molecular clouds, is mostly due to cosmic rays. So we want to understand this complicated physics, and we really do need a picture that's driven by both comparison between the simulation and the theory and the observation. I think uh, we can't really make too much progress moving forward unless we have this comparison between simulation theory and observation. And of course, in order to make a meaningful comparison between simulations and observations, one needs sort of appropriate tools. And one tool I'd like to talk about in my very brief time today is the so-called probability distribution function, or PDF. And the PDF has been studied um, both from a simulation and, and a theoretical perspective on atomic and molecular gas. So why is the PDF so important? Well, it's actually particularly important for theories of star formation. And so a number of different uh, theoretical theories of, of modern understanding of how stars form are actually based on integrals 
over a, a density PDF. And that's because the PDF essentially tells you the fraction of dense gas in your cloud. And so stars, of course, only really form in the densest part of the PDF. And so by constructing a PDF of the dense gas, you're able to get a measurement of the fraction of dense gas and then relate that to some sort of star formation efficiency. And I've put up a few of the, the references, various groups that are involved in, under, in theoretical modeling of star formation. And really, all of these models do use uh, uh, some sort of PDF form in order to get their star formation efficiencies. Now, observations have also been very interested in measuring the PDF. Um, I've put, for example, two different studies here, one from the diffuse, um, diffuse ISM, so H1 and, uh, and H alpha. H alpha, of course, tracing the warm ionized medium. In this particular study, they found that the uh, PDFs of the diffuse gas are very, very nice log normal distributions. Similarly, simulations uh, without self-gravity, so it's just simulations of, of driven uh, turbulence, both isotropic and, and anisotropic turbulence, also see these beautiful log normal PDFs. And so this seems to be a very nice area of agreement between simulation and observation in that both, uh, both of them in a turbulent medium seem to be coming towards this log normal uh, PDF distribution. On the molecular cloud, uh, in the molecular cloud community, uh, looking at dust PDFs, so these are Herschel PDFs from a, a study by Schneider et al. in 2014. This is just one example of many, many studies. They again see some sort of log normal portion, but at the higher density in, especially densities much past AV of about one, you transition into this so-called power law tail regime. And so this is where gravity starts to become extremely important and draws out a power law distribution in the gas. Again, agreeing very well with simulations. So simulations that include self-gravity also see extremely similar distributions. And so the question that myself and my collaborators ask is, well, all of these studies sort of are, are piecemealed. We have a community that is involved in just looking at the, what's happening in the diffuse gas. We have communities that are involved in looking at what's happening to the dense molecular gas. But there's no study out there that says, well, what happens when we take the same cloud, look at the H1, look at the H2, and then compare them. And so that's essentially what we did um, in connection to the H1 to H2 transition. And we chose Perseus as a, a first uh, test case. Perseus is very nice because it's a sort of a nearby laboratory. There's many, many different data sets, um, including the complete two-mass data set and the CO um, uh, CFA survey, as well as H1 from the GALFA survey. So there's many, many data sets that are available and that exist. And furthermore, that Perseus has been well studied in all these data sets. And so there's a number of uh, studies um, from uh, Min Young Lee and her collaborators from 2012 up until this year that have been looking in great detail at the multiphase nature of the Perseus molecular cloud. And they were able to construct, um, based on the total gas and dust uh, distribution from two mass and IRS, from GALFA data uh, tracing the atomic H1, uh, they were able to construct a, a H2 map from, from combining these different data sets. And so we have this multi-phase uh, data set distribution for Perseus that we can investigate the PDFs in. So the H1 PDF of Perseus, so this is the atomic gas in and around the Perseus molecular cloud as seen from the GALFA uh, survey taken with Arecibo. This is the PDF. And on, on your right, I've plotted some PDFs from uh, just sort of generic MHD simulations. The PDF of Perseus, you can tell, is very well described by a log normal distribution. This dotted line here is a, is a log normal fit to the distribution. It's extremely narrow. So past AV of about 1, the PDF is sort of declining very, very suddenly. Really close, actually, to the, the H1 to H2 transition that's been measured for Perseus. And again, the shape being log normal, it seems to agree very well with simulations that uh, have no self-gravity in it. If we go and look at the total gas PDF, uh, gas and dust, of Perseus, we see actually uh, very similar to what we find in MHD simulations, where we include turbulence plus self-gravity, that there's some sort of seemingly log normal portion and then a transition out at higher densities to a power law tail. This is, again, exactly what we see in, uh, in generic MHD simulations that also include self-gravity. And now if we put these PDFs together, so this is the multi-phase view. So we have sort of traced out in red here the H1 PDF that I just showed you with its nice log normal shape, the total gas PDF here in black with a log normal plus a power law tail, and then the 
NH2 PDF, so the molecular PDF traced out here in blue. And the blue PDF, again, is only tracing the molecules, so very different from this black PDF, which is tracing both the gas and the molecules. It only really has this power law tail contribution. Now, the interesting thing is that if you notice the H1 PDF here falling very, very rapidly past the, H, the H1 to H2 transition that I've drawn out here in the line, um, this is actually the point where the power law tail forms. And so it seems that the PDF, if, you, if you're able to uh, separate out the atomic PDF from the total uh, molecular PDF, you're able to actually trace out the H1 to H2 transition because this is where this power law tail is starting to form in the data. <coughs> This actually could be complementary to other methods that are geared towards trying to measure the H1 to H2 transition. So there's two methods here. So one can actually go and measure UV absorption lines and, and measure the H1 to H2 transition where you see this sharp, uh, sharp increase in the H2 fraction. Or you can also use different gas tracers. And so it seems the PDF can be a third complementary measure in order to get the H1 to H2 transition. One other thing we were interested in this study was actually measuring the sonic Mach number in Perseus. And the reason why we wanted to do this is because the PDF and the Mach number have been seen to have relationships between each other in simulations. And so I'd like to demonstrate that for you here. So this is a simulation, uh, MHD turbulence simulation with a Mach number of 0.5, so it's subsonic. And this is its corresponding PDF. Now if I increase the sonic Mach number, the PDF also changes. So this is now a, son a supersonic simulation with a Mach number of 2. And the corresponding PDF got broader, the tails got longer, and it got more peaked. I can continue to increase the Mach number here, and you see this trend just sort of exaggerates itself as the Mach number increased. This is simulations. So this is not the real world. So what happens when we look at the PDFs of Perseus? We can actually compare the PDF Mach number we would measure in Perseus to a more observationally motivated measurement. Uh, and that's uh, through a technique where we measure absorption lines in the H1. And it just so happens that a study by Stanimirovich in 2014 actually measured background absorbers in the Perseus molecular cloud. And so we were able to get spin temperature measurements uh, in the H1. And from there, we can construct, um, based on the spin temperature and the kinetic temperature from the emission line, we can construct a histogram of the Mach number in Perseus. And so this is the, the Mach number distribution as measured from the absorption line data. And you see that, well, it's quite supersonic. The peak is around 4, but you can have Mach numbers out towards, towards 10 or even higher in the H1 in Perseus. So it's already very supersonic. If we compare this to a Mach number that we might measure from the atomic gas distribution, this is extremely narrow, actually. If you compare this to simulations, this implies a much lower Mach number, so actually more like transonic values of Mach number. And so it seems that the PDF, at least in molecular clouds, in H1, does not actually trace the Mach number as we see in simulations. Um, we actually have much, much larger Mach numbers than we would measure from the PDF. And that's, again, uh, we speculate because of the H1 to H2 transition. It depletes the H1, and this causes the PDF to be much narrower. And so at that point, I'd like to, to conclude. Um, you know, we've, we found, indeed, a very nice log normal shape in the H1 in uh, the Perseus molecular cloud. So molecular clouds can, indeed, have log normal distributions in the diffuse gas. And in particularly, uh, we found that the transition from the log normal to the power law tail happens right around the H1 to H2 transition. And this means that the PDF could be a powerful tool for, for measuring the H1 to H2 transition. I've called this conclusions, but I'd really like to call it beginnings. So this was just a first case study. Uh, Nia Amara is actually also applying uh, PDFs of H1 and, and molecule, uh, mo molecular line tracers to various clouds. So stay tuned. There's more to come. Thank you. You, you need a critical shielding of the, of the gas in order to form the molecules. And it's actually uh, also right around the predicted uh, regime that the, the Krumholtz and McKee model predicts for a, a critical mass of H1 in order to shield, um, uh, properly shield for the H2 to form. But that's around the point where gravity takes over. 
Right, that's 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 one of our findings. Yeah. Well, but that's part of the coincidence of the solar neighborhood. I mean, lack of center region in the other galaxies is different. Mm -hmm. So it's a coincidence. It's not the requirement that you need to make more tools in order for gravity to go. Yeah, and we only, so, so far this has just been done for Perseus. And so I think that's why we need to look at this in, in additional clouds in order to see if it's really environment dependent. So this is really just a first, a first case study. Yeah. Their sensitivity to that ratio is, uh, is extreme. And so they've gotten very precise profiles of, of the regime in which you begin to turn over from a problem. Yeah, we're, we're planning actually to, to compare with other tracers as well. And yeah, that's a very good point. Other questions? Mm. Yes. A, a, another thing you might look at would be to understand uh, the transition of carbon from carbon 2 to carbon 1 to uh, CO, because uh, that all of those are observable, unlike actual molecular hydrogen, which is <coughs> only observable by proxy. Right. So uh, understanding the chemistry of carbon as a function of density and turbulence is, is, is perhaps a little bit more... Yeah, it would be very interesting to see how, how the, those the PDFs of other tracers would compare with their transitions. Yeah. Lastly, can you test the question of, of how uh, bound the cloud is um, by computing the burial ratio from molecular line observations as a function of the threshold column density? In My other words, if you take the threshold column density lower and lower, you'll take it down below the <coughs> and then you might find a change in the burial ratio. Yeah, it might be good actually to first take a look at the simulations because then we can actually compute a 3D virial parameter. Whereas in the observations, of course, we only have line of sight. So that might be very nice for the simulation aspect. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy that I'm uh, given the second uh, uh, chance to talk about another topic, um, which is very interesting. Uh, as we know, uh, magnetic field is very important in astrophysical medium. In the meantime, the uh, techniques available to detect it is uh, very limited. Uh, so there we see. Uh, there are different attempts to detect them indirectly. Uh, but here I'm actually uh, introducing uh, a technique that can trace magnetic field directly. So this uh, uh, is uh, based on uh, the fact that atoms can be aligned by anisotropic radiation. So this is the uh, basic uh, uh, idea. So basically, uh, uh, you can imagine this is a, a, a you know, normal system with atoms with spin uh, randomized in uh, any direction. But in the case of when you have uh, anisotropic radiation, okay, let's think about the simplest case, a beam of light. Uh, in this case, they, uh, you have photons uh, with spin, uh, either uh, along the direction of uh, radiation or anti-parallel. So there is nothing in the perpendicular direction. So this means that uh, this kind of radiation has uh, extra angular momentum. So when they interact with uh, atoms, this uh, uh, extra angular momentum can be deposited into the 
uh, system and get atoms aligned. And so basically, this is a, a angular momentum exchange. Uh, in fact, a similar thing uh, also happens with uh, dust. Uh, so uh, as probably any, many of you uh, know that uh, grains can be also aligned by anisotropic radiation. So uh, we now uh, see that uh, uh, green alignment has been uh, 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 explored as a uh, you know powerful tracer for magnetic field. Uh, in the meantime, we shouldn't forget this. There is uh, also we have also atoms which can be also used. Uh, so uh, if we go into a bit uh, uh, more uh, microscopically, this is what's happening. So as I said before, you have a uh, imagine you have a beam of light. You have this uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, angular momentum in these uh, uh, two directions, parallel and anti-parallel. You so for these simple atoms, you can easily imagine that uh, atoms can be pumped from uh, these two uh, one and minus one particular sublevels to the upper state, but nothing happened from this uh, zero sublevel. So this means that uh, uh, after a while, after uh, the pumping going on for a while, these atoms will be you know differentially uh, occupied. And uh, this surely would uh, uh, have uh, consequences, for instance, induce polarization uh, for lines, which I will speak uh, in a moment. Uh, uh, OK, what else? OK, anyway, <clears throat> I, one thing I should stress that uh, here we are talking about the very, uh, basically, the magnetic field in diffuse medium. So it's not uh, uh, anything strong like uh, in uh, stars in our uh, sun where uh, there is a uh, 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 magnetic splitting. Basically, in this case, these magnetic sublevels are of the same uh, energy level. So just to uh, uh, stress that this is not a Zeeman effect, has uh, nothing to do with Zeeman because there is no magnetic splitting. So everything here we are talking about is not a re uh, uh, in relation to energy, but uh, uh, angular momentum. All right. So okay, I'm uh, uh, introducing this uh, uh, technique as a, a magnetic tracer. So so far, what's the magnetic? Where is the magnetic field? Okay, so here it uh, is uh, how it's uh, uh, working. So basically, uh, yes, the atoms can be uh, uh, aligned by the anisotropic radiation. Uh, when you have a magnetic field, magnetic field, as you know, not necessarily in the same direction as the. Uh, uh, the axis of the radiation. So in this case, the magnetic field would uh, make the atoms precess around the magnetic field. And uh, in this case, modulate the occupations on the ground state. So just give you an example. This, uh, this is uh, uh, the occupation for uh, sodium we calculated for two cases. One is the case when magnetic field is aligned with the radiation. And this is another case uh, uh, when they are perpendicular to each other. As you can see, the occupations uh, are different. And this will be reflected in the uh, polarization signal. So that's how we detect this magnetic field direction. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, basically, because uh, we are talking about uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon on the ground state, so as we know, ground state is long-lived. So this means that it can be sensitive to a uh, weak magnetic field as the one in the uh, interstellar medium. And also because of the uh, uh, the fact that it's long lived, uh, this means that uh, the uh, atoms can be processed, processed around the magnetic field many times during their lifetime. And as a result, they, uh, uh, because of the averaging of many periods, as a result, alignment can be only in parallel and perpendicular to magnetic field. And uh, this has an important consequence for the polarization of uh, uh, absorption lines. Uh, so you can easily imagine, so uh, the absorption from such atoms uh, that are aligned would be polarized. And uh, so this is uh, uh, basically uh, some alignment parameter, just to give you some uh, example. So this is for the case when the total angular momentum is one, and this is the definition uh, of alignment parameter. As you can see, it's. Uh, Measures the difference between uh, among different sublevels. Uh, all right. So this is the occupation, and uh, uh, correspondingly, this is the polarization of absorption. 
as a function of the uh, angle between the magnetic field and the radiation. So indeed, the polarization can be only in, uh, uh, because here axis is chosen as the uh, uh, direction of magnetic field. So when this uh, value, the polarization is uh, positive, means that the, the polarization is parallel to magnetic field. If it's negative, it means it's uh, uh, perpendicular to magnetic field. So basically, we can, uh, even without a, a precise measurement, once we detect the, the direction of polar, polar, polarization of this uh, absorption line, we would immediately know the uh, direction of the uh, magnetic field within this 90 degree degeneracy. And then if we uh, can uh, you know, go a bit further, get the, the precise uh, degree, and we can uh, get the uh, 3D magnetic field, basically. And this is a generic feature. So uh, whatever uh, atoms uh, you are considering, it's always the, the case. So the polarization is either parallel to magnetic field or perpendicular to magnetic field. OK. so. Apart from uh, absorption, there is uh, also another possibility, uh, these uh, fine structure lines. Basically, it's uh, uh, similarly the pumping from the ground, ground state uh, to the upper state, and then they, uh, they come back to the uh, ground state. So when you have you know, uh, different sublevels uh, on the ground state, the transition, uh, let me just stress here, it's not a magnetic sublevel. It's just fine structure uh, on the ground state. So the transition between them uh, will be also polarized because of the alignment on the uh, metastable level, so similar uh, situation. And uh, so uh, in this case, these fine structure lines would have a similar feature, so basically either parallel or perpendicular to a magnetic field, which can be also uh, you know, uh, utilized to uh, get easily the 2D uh, uh, magnetic field projection on the plane of sky. <coughs> Uh, actually, not only that, these uh, scattering lines can be also polarized. Uh, so this is a, a, a calculation uh, just to show this. Uh, this is uh, actually for our uh, uh, solar system. So the pumping is from uh, the sun, of course. And uh, so basically, this is the uh, situation. We consider some uh, uh, atoms on some object, for instance, an eye or, or a comet, whatever you're considering. And uh, so this uh, uh, light from uh, the sun would uh, pump the atoms, get them aligned. And uh, as, the cons as the result, uh, the scattering from such uh, aligned atoms will be also polarized. And uh, so this is uh, to show you the result, the polarization as a function. So basically here, as a function of the uh, direction of magnetic field. So theta b, phi b uh, is a, uh, measures the uh, uh, direction of magnetic field. And as you can see, the polarization is, uh, uh, traces uh, the magnetic field. Uh, so this another plot shows that, indeed, uh, uh, the, magnetic, uh, the polarization is sensitive to magnetic field direction. OK, and uh, actually, uh, uh, this uh, atomic alignment can happen anywhere you have uh, uh, anisotropic radiation, as we can imagine there. Uh, basically, it's uh, rare that you have a totally isotropic radiation field. So whenever you have any anisotropy in the radiation field, then atomic alignment can happen. So this is, a, uh, again, a calculation for a capillarian disk, and this is the signal we uh, expect. Uh, also, for uh, this another example, so in the binary system, where you know uh, the radiation is also anisotropic, and you can also get the uh, polarized signal. Uh, in fact, I should say that uh, this atomic alignment not only induces polarization or affect polarization of lines, but also affect line intensity. So this means that. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, process would affect our uh, study, for instance, on the chemistry. So because of which uh, they, they uh, frequently they uh, use the line uh, intensity ratio, for instance, to de detect, the, uh, to infer the uh, uh, chemical abundance. But uh, 
I don't think there is uh, any study that uh, takes into account that uh, uh, the line ratio can be changed due to atopic alignment. This, uh, uh, so this means that the magnetic field uh, can also uh, uh, modify the, your... Uh, or, uh, if you don't take that into account, you would get a wrong conclusion of your uh, metallicity study, for instance. Okay, so this is uh, uh, basically this uh, inferred col column density, uh, the variation due to the uh, change of the direction of magnetic field. And uh, so here is uh, uh, an, an example for common one transition, and also you can see these uh, line intensity changes uh, just due to the uh, change of direction of magnetic field. All right. So let me just uh, uh, summarize. Uh, so uh, uh, our claim is that uh, uh, atomic alignment happens anywhere you, uh, when you have uh, anisotropic radiation. So it's a, a universal phenomenon, the same as uh, uh, green alignment. And it can induce polarization in uh, uh, different uh, lines, in absorption lines, in uh, fine structure lines and also in emission lines. And uh, this means that this uh, tracer uh, uh, by uh, atomic alignment is a very powerful tool that we should uh, uh, use to uh, detect magnetic field in different uh, uh, environment. Basically, it uh, applies to any diffuse medium, ranging from our uh, interplanetary medium to uh, all the way to the uh, high redshift uh, medium. Uh, uh, I think uh, so far this is, is still like a, 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 how to say, a virgin line. So there is only uh, one uh, observational study in 2007, uh, so one year after our publication of our first paper, there is some detection of HR absorption uh, polarization. Uh, so uh, I think this means that there are plenty of opportunities in this field, so this is basically a very new field, and I welcome any suggestions and comments from you. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> in the case of general relativity, the GPS systems that everyone uses to navigate yeah. must rely on the procedure of VR and the study correction. So yeah, that, that's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so, you said that there is this ambiguity about the orientation of the magnetic field, 90 degree ambiguity. Yeah. This is because you don't know the direction of anisotropy of the radiation, correct? If you uh, already knew the correct direction of anisotropy, yeah. I presume yeah. then you will break the degeneracy? In some way, yes. Uh, because actually this... Uh, so theoretically, we know it well. It uh, this switch of... Uh, uh, okay. Okay, I hope you can see it. Yeah. It always happens as uh, at this angle, so this is universal. It's independent of uh, species or lines. But indeed, we need to know this angle. Right. Yeah, yeah. But I was just thinking, in your, if you're looking at some region of the ISM, mm -hmm. you probably know where the radiation is coming from, from nearby bright. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know the direction, and so yeah. You can in do that the case, ambiguity. yeah, yeah. In that case, we can get 3D magnetic field. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, even in the simplest scenario where you don't have other information, you can get a 2D magnetic field already. Uh. Can you say something about time scales? Uh, how much time does it take to align these atoms as a function of the intensity of the radiation? And how much time does it take for collisions to re-randomize them? Uh, where's the competition? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a good question. Indeed, uh, uh, this uh, should work in the radiatively dominated regime. So uh, it shouldn't be, uh, uh, there's, uh, nothing will happen in the collision 
uh, clearance dominated regime. So actually, I think we did some calculation uh, for, uh, for instance, O type star. Uh, the radius, if I remember correctly, oh, it was so so long time ago we did the calculation. I think it's, uh, uh, well, of course, it depends on the lines you are considering. So it's about, uh, uh, I think, uh, 10 parsec also. So within this radius, the radiation is uh, strong enough to be dominant. But uh, if you go beyond that, uh, the clearance would indeed destroy it. Well, I'm thinking of disks, for example, where the densities are quite high. Mm -hmm. um, whether, whether it would work in those environments. Ah, yeah. For disk, indeed. So I think uh, the, uh, the best place would be uh, for uh, debris disks, where density is uh, relatively low. Yeah. added a blank slide to my presentation. Let me get rid of that. And, okay. Um, first of all, it, it's amazing that you have so many people coming to these lunches. Coming from WV, where we have five astronomy faculty, this is really awesome. So I'm going to kind of stick to a little bit of the theme, because I will be talking about the interstellar medium and magnetic fields, but in a very different context from the other two talks. So I'll be talking about fast radio bursts, um, and in particular, the discovery of a new FRB um, with the GBT. Um, for those of you in the field, this is kind of a different list of collaborators than I usually put up when I talk about pulsar FRB things, but this burst was actually found in a 21 centimeter intensity mapping experiment. Um, and so that, that's kind of cool, so we have a new collaboration with, with people working on this. So this, this burst is going to be published um, in Nature um, on December 2nd, and so it's still embargoed. So if you, any of you are members of the press, I'm supposed to say you're not allowed to write an article or paper on it. Oh, is it? Okay, well, don't, don't leak it to the press. <laughs> so um, I'd like to start with just this story of these fast radio bursts, because I think it's a really nice illustration of just the way science works. So back in around 2006, um, pulsar astronomers started to do a very different thing with their search data. And so instead of just looking for periodic signals in search data, as we expected from radio pulsars, we decided to start looking for single pulses in radio data. So just bright, isolated bursts of radio emission. And as we did that, we realized that there was a whole other class of pulsars that were previously unknown. We called them RATs, for rotating radio transients. Um, we're going to see some plots like this for FRBs, so let me just illustrate what these are. On the x-axis here is dispersion measure. So this is the integrated column density of electrons along the line of sight to the source, and this is time. And so for a pulsar up there that emits regularly one pulse for every rotation period at a particular dispersion measure, which corresponds to a particular distance, we see a long train of pulses. They may vary in intensity up and down, but we see pretty constant emission over the course of this observation. Um, for these rats, these very sporadic pulsars, we may see only one, two, three, four, faint, maybe that's a fifth faint pulse over the course of, say, you know, a several minute observation. So for some reason, these sporadic pulsars are emitting pulses and then turning off um, for you know, minutes to, to even hours sometimes. Um, so the DMs of these pulsars and these rats, of course, place them within our galaxy. Um, if we take an electron density model for the galaxy and we integrate out to this dispersion measure, you know, it puts them at distances of kiloparsecs or so. Okay. This is a little bit of background. So we started looking at all pulsar surveys, even archival surveys, by doing these single pulse searches. And in 2007, um, we found a burst in an archival survey uh, back from 1998, 1999, of the Small Magellanic Cloud. And so this is exactly the same type of plot as in the previous slide. Um, in this case, what you'll see, though, is that there's one very, very bright radio burst it's at a very high DM. It's at a DM of about 400, whereas in the previous plots, those DMs were like 40. Um, this stuff is radio frequency interference. You can just ignore this. So this was kind of a mystery. There was this very bright burst um, at a very large DM, indicating that this was coming from an extragalactic source, not consistent with our galaxy. There was a lot of questioning about whether this was real or not. Um, this shows the location of this first 
First, this is the small Magellanic Cloud. It's well outside of the cloud. And there's no evidence that there's any excess gas that could contribute to that very, very high dispersion measure. So we're pretty sure this was real. Um, what we do as a reality check for all of these things is plot the arrival time of the radio burst versus frequency. We see this very nice slope, which is perfectly consistent to the frequency to the minus 2 law that you expect for cold plasma dispersion. So this looks really good. We think it's real. Um, everyone was very excited. And then in 2010, there was a paper published just as we were having NSF proposal reviewed, which got because people said, oh, this isn't real anymore. Um, that reported these other class of sources called peritons. So they came up with this name. These are like winged deer that fly. And um, I think basically because they're one thing that looks like another thing, right? And so they were saying, our bursts look, at, look astrophys astrophysical, but they're really not. They're really some kind of radio frequency interference. So these authors published a paper in 2010 um, where they had very similar structures detected also with the Parkes telescope, also with the exact same frequency as our burst, right? Very suspicious. However, their pulses were detected in all 13 beams of the Parkes multi-beam receiver, which showed that they could not be from a source. They had to be some kind of either terrestrial interference or maybe atmospheric phenomena. So that put a damper on this original burst, which people were calling the Lorimer burst. Um, lots of people said, you know, that thing's not astrophysical. Um, a little bit of interest was lost in the field until a couple years ago, um, in 2013, where many more of these fast radio bursts were discovered in another survey with Parks, also at 1.4 gigahertz, the same frequency. And so as of a year ago, there are a bunch of these things known. These green diamonds show the dispersion measures of these fast radio bursts versus galactic latitude. The blue circles are the radio pulsars. So you can see this is clearly a totally other phenomenon. These FRBs have much higher dispersion measures than you would expect given their galactic latitude. People generally said, OK, yes, these are astrophysical. We believe it again. There's a little bit of skepticism because they were all detected with Parks, all at the same frequency, all at 1.4 gigahertz. Um, finally, we detected one with our SIBO. Um, this happened last year, um, also at the same frequency and with a very similar kind of receiver. This green circle just shows where this FRB lies in the sky. The DM is very, very large. There's nothing in our galaxy that could possibly explain this much excess electron density. Um, still the same frequency, however. In the meantime, um, this is a paper by Petroff et al. I forgot to put the reference. But recently, peritons were shown to be associated with microwave ovens. Um, so this paper came out about six months ago. And they looked at the times of the um, peritons, and they found that they were all right around lunchtime um, when people in the visitor center, the little visiting science center, which is right in front of the telescope, were heating up their lunches. And um, of course, the microwave is in a Faraday cage. It's not supposed to be emitting any rate, but people would like open the door just before the beep went off. And anyway, so this was good though because it showed a reason for those peritons and provided more evidence that the other parks bursts were indeed astrophysical because they didn't look like this. They didn't all happen at, at noon. Um, okay, so a little bit of a review about the properties of these FRBs before I talk about our GBT FRB. Um, they're all very bright. Um, they're distant. If you work out you know, a typical intergalactic medium electron density, you get like 100 megaparsecs to a gigaparsec, something like this. Um, they're much more weakly scattered than you would expect for a galactic um, source with this dispersion measure, right? So we can see the pulses are scattered. Um, if they were in the galaxy with that high a DM, you'd expect a really large scattering channel. We don't see that. That's other evidence that they're um, extra galactic or they have some localized stuff near the source. Um, in general, they're non-repeating, although there's one very interesting paper um, which suggests that one of these bursts has actually repeated with a very different DM. And it's, it's very compelling, actually, and I think the jury's still out on that. Um, there's not a lot of polarization measurements, just one. It indicated a very small degree of circular polarization. Okay, and of course, there has been paper after paper um, suggesting different origins for these bursts. Um, these could be extragalactic magnetars emitting very bright radio pulses. Um, Maybe they're something less exotic. There are pulsars like the crab pulsar that emit giant pulses. And every once in a while, there's an extragalactic pulse that's just bright enough you know, to be able to, to reach us here in the Milky Way with enough brightness. Um, black holes, a lot of different scenarios with binary black holes, evaporating black holes. Um, Avi has a really nice paper that, that these could be due to galactic flare stars. Again, something much less exotic in our galaxy, radio flare stars with dense ionized material surrounding them. Um, my favorite is that these are microwave ovens too, but they're extra galactic <laughs> microwave ovens, which I think would be really fun. Um, and I don't think all of these FRBs actually necessarily need to fall into any one of these categories. It could be 
all of the above, and it could also be none of the above. Um, the correct mechanism for these things, you know, may not have been proposed yet. So let's move to the FRB detective at the GBT recently. Um, so this fast radio burst, we named them by the date. So this is in data from 2011, um, but we just recently got to analyzing the data now because this data was taken for a very different experiment for this intensity mapping, mapping stuff. Um, and then I was talking to Jeff Peterson at CMU and we, we realized, oh wow, we could also look at this for, for FRBs. Um, so the one really nice thing about this is that this data was taken at 820 megahertz, um, not 1.4 gigahertz, so it's a different frequency. Um, we believe they were astrophysical before this, but it's yet another sort of evidence that these things are really astrophysical. This is with a very different kind of receiver, a very different radio frequency. Um, we measure scattering in the burst. So this shows the burst profile, and uh, you can see the blue dotted line is the high frequency, and the red dotted line is the low, and the green is the middle. And what you're supposed to see here is that the pulse broadens as you go to lower frequencies, which is in indicative of scattering um, in the interstellar medium. Another thing we can detect is scintillation. So this shows frequency versus time, just like that other plot. But if we zoom in on a little region of this, we see very narrow band scintillation in the signal. So the intensity varies on a very, very short frequency scale. The reason this is cool is that this looks just like we would expect for a galactic pulsar in this direction, for something very close to us. So the inferred scattering time scale from this is very, very small. And yet this shows a much larger scattering time scale, consistent with something at a much farther DM. And so we're interpreting this as, as this has to really imply an extragalactic source with scattering from the Milky Way and scattering from another galaxy. Um, we can also use the slope of this. We measure an extremely precise slope for this um, to place a constraint on the size scale of the source region, and we think it has to be bigger than about 10 AU or so. Um, we measure polarization for this. So as I mentioned, there's only been one polarization measurement for all these other bursts. Um, and for this one, we measure a fairly significant degree of linear polarization, about 40%. This is very similar to pulsars. If I looked at this polarization profile, um, the blue and the green are the linear, the red is the circular. We don't really believe the circular. We think that may be instrumental. We believe the linear, though. It's, it's very similar to what we see for pulsars, um, which might tell, tell us something about the emission mechanism. Um, we measure a rotation measure. It's quite large. This is much larger than expected for a galactic pulsar in this, this direction. Um, so we think that there might, might, must be dense magnetized material that's very close to the source. Okay, so I'll just leave this up. This is my last slide. Um, what's next for this FRB stuff? So I've told you a very incomplete picture. There's still tons of things that, that we don't know. Um, so there's lots of searches ongoing. Everyone is looking for these things in their pulsar surveys. Um, the current event rate estimates are like a few thousand per sky per day. Um, the fields of view of the surveys are quite small, so you need to look for quite a long time to find one, however. Um, there are a lot of people, including us, who are searching for repeated bursts from previously found FRBs. So if, if this model um, that these are flare stars, for instance, is correct, um, or, or magnetars or pulsars, we should see repeated bursts, and that would tell us a lot. Um, there are a lot of real-time FRB detectors coming online. So all of the previous bursts, the localization was like 14 arc minutes, and they were found in general like years after the fact. Um, so you can't go and point at this source and, and try to find an electromagnetic counterpart. Um, at the VLA, there's a survey um, where they're going to be able to get on an electromagnetic counterpart within minutes, and they have position accuracy of arc, of arc seconds instead of arc minutes. So this is very exciting, um, and we'll probably hear news of electromagnetic counterparts to these things very soon, I hope. Um, and of course, that will let us make very dramatic gains, because we'll know, you know much better how far away these things are. We'll know if they're associated with galaxies or, or stars or whatnot. So thank you. Yeah. That's... Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, they're not bright enough, I think. I mean, the brightest ones, they're you know, sort of a Jansky or so. Yeah. Right. That's a, that's a, that's a great idea. Yes. Frequency interference. Uh -huh. So does that sort of rule out all the naysayers at this point because you're in this protected zone with the GBT? I, w I mean, I would say we still have RFI with the GBT, even though it's protected. But I really don't think there's any naysayers now who are saying that it's radio frequency interference. I think with the other frequency detection um, 
and all, all of this other evidence, like the scattering and the scintillation and the polarization that looks so much like an astrophysical source. I don't think there are any naysayers. Are there any naysayers here? I don't believe it. <laughs> so, you were kind of presenting the DM uh -huh. scattering as two independent arguments for this cosmological yeah. distance. Right. Are they really independent? Because I thought large DM goes with large scattering anyway. Well, they, they are independent, actually. So we know um, the source has to be well outside of the galaxy because the DM is so large. If the source were in our galaxy, though, um, and, you know, pulsars with DMs of, say, 400 um, are extremely scattered. They have very long scattering tails because there's a ton of dense material in between us and the pulsar. For these FRBs, they have DMs of 400, but they're very lightly scattered. And the only way to make that happen is to put them very far away and have the material clumped close to the pulsar and close to the Earth. And you basically, you lose the, this, because of this lever arm effect, you kind of okay, lose so I, the I effect of scattering. I thought you were saying that this extra scattering demands the distance. What you're saying is it's not scattered enough. Exactly. It's more weakly scattered than we would expect for a source in our galaxy with roughly constant electron density between us and the source. You, you can do that too. You can do that too. It says that there's a region of localized density at the source. It, it could be. It could be. You said that you found this one in what was an H1 search. That's a really good question. I don't know. Yeah, this is a redshift at H1 survey that I think this survey was unusual and that it had um, good enough time resolution to do this kind of thing. I think most of them don't have like millisecond time resolution. Um, so I think in general, the only surveys that are taken with the right kind of time and frequency re resolution are, are pul pulsar surveys in general. I, I think. I don't know much about the other H1 surveys. That would, be, that would be awesome if they could, because we need a lot of time to detect one of these. So it's kind of not very compelling for tax when you ask for 500 hours for one FRB. But if you can do it along the way, you know, along with something else, that's... Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't know. We have so few that it's really hard to calculate a luminosity distribution or something. But yeah. If you could do it commensally, it'd be worth doing for sure. We're, we're looking for these in the SDT survey data. There is a calculation that it should show up because we just observe so much of the sky that the possibility in the sense of the spectrum, of course, we don't know how to see. Yeah, we really don't know what it looks like at all. Well, if they're magnetars, we know that these magnetars have very flat spectra. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if you could detect them at 90 gigahertz. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's really great. Walked off with the um, mic. Okay, great. Uh, yes, I'm delighted to be here, and I'll uh, wrap up today with a new developing mystery, I would say, with the pulsar population in the very center of our galaxy. So instead of talking about new, exciting, discovered properties of unknown sources, we'll talk about the lack of discovery of very well-known sources. In this, time. Okay, this is work done with Ryan O'Leary, who is a PhD student here in the ITC, and then now is a postdoc in Boulder. 
All right, so for the purposes of this talk, the galactic center means really the central parsec of the galaxy. Um, and we see in the central parsec a lot of these blue points here, these young stars. So we know that there are about a couple hundred now young, massive stars that should then become neutron stars, as well as other stellar populations here in the red, older stellar populations. And we also see hot magnetized gas in the galactic center here in the X-ray. Okay, if we zoom way in on that infrared picture, then famously, uh, we can resolve individual stellar orbits in the very center of the galaxy uh, with periods of 10 to 100 years or so. And in particular, you can weigh with these stars this unseen mass at the very center here in this image, which is the best evidence that we have for the existence of a massive black hole in the universe in Sagittarius A star, the center of the galaxy. Okay, but people are unsatisfied so far just with those spectacular observations and so are pushing to ever higher angular resolution, both in the near infrared, like in that image, by using interferometry with the VLT, this new instrument gravity, and also with the Event Horizon telescopes so doing very high angular resolution, uh, very long baseline interferometry at some millimeter wavelengths. And what's cool about this then is with that angular resolution, you can get down to the expected size comparable to the event horizon of a black hole in Sag J star, and so get information about strong gravity up here, some measures of the strength of a gravitational field in various experiments. And so get information here for strong field GR very close to an event horizon. And what's particularly cool about the Galactic Center for this experiment is we can also get independent information about strong gravity, maybe from the orbits of, say, these known stars that I just showed, the S stars, or maybe from closer stars that are yet discovered. Okay, and just as an update, uh, people in my group at MPE are, are working very furiously to get gravity working. So this is a four-telescope beam combiner at the VLT, at the VLT um, combining the light from all of these four eight-meter telescopes eventually, although right now with the smaller telescopes. And the idea is to have this online in the Galactic Center in time for the next closest approach of S2, this famous star, um, which is happening in 2018 to try to measure post-Newtonian effects. And as I said, try to find fainter stars that you can do even better relativistic effects with. Okay, but uh, anything that you can do as to in terms of studying gravity with stellar orbits, you can do much better if you can find pulsars on similar orbits and time them. And so this has been one motivation for deep radio searches over the years um, for pulsars very close to the galactic center. Uh, and you expect them to be there since, as I said, we see these massive stars. We know, well, we can constrain at least the star formation history in the galactic center. And so there have been predictions for a long time that you should be able to find many pulsars in the center of the galaxy, in the central parsec, and even on promising orbits for doing these GR-type studies. And you can show you can do these really amazing tests of even strong field general relativity using the right pulsar orbits. Okay. And yet, despite all these surveys and all this interest in doing this, this is the known pulsar population near the galactic center as of a couple years ago. So this little tiny purple dot is the central parsec, and the known pulsars are instead out here at distances of tens of parsecs and are probably associated with completely different stellar populations, other young star clusters. And so the previous thinking of why this was the case, that we don't see these, is because we see that the image of the galactic center black hole in the radio is broadened. Um, from interstellar scattering along the line of sight. And if that, stel if that scattering material is located close to the galactic center, then it would broaden your pulses so much that you would not at normal radio frequencies be able to detect pulsars. So you could basically cast a screen somewhere about this size that prevents you from detecting the, the normal radio pulsars that you want to see. Okay. This has been a really exciting development in the past couple years. So you may have heard about this gas cloud G2. Um, that was heading towards right on a radial orbit right towards the galactic center. And so for monitoring what would happen when this cloud arrived at Sag J star, they were intensely looking in the x-rays to try to monitor for this. And instead what they found was a radio outburst here shown in the light curve with Swift from a new magnetar that's only 0.1 parsecs in projection from Sag J star. So by far the closest known pulsar uh, to the galactic center. And this was discovered with Swift and then found periodicities with new star. And yes, the first pulsar in the central parsec, which is pretty strange because we know about 20 magnetars in the galaxy compared to about 2,000 normal, bright, young radio pulsars. Okay, but, but in the previous picture with the scattering, maybe this makes a lot of sense. So maybe if there's this radio screen and we can't see through, then we can only see a pulsar if it goes off in the X-ray. Okay, and so for that reason, I think... Uh, if if had, people had been asked, there would be a clear prediction to make at this point, which is this all makes sense as long as we cannot detect this magnetar in the radio. Okay, If you can detect it in the radio, right, you would not expect that. First, because they rarely even show radio emission, but secondly, because 
the screen should prevent you from detecting radio pulses. Okay, so that's all well and good, except that then you can detect this in the radio over a huge frequency range, and you can measure exactly the amount of scattering in time that you get as a function of frequency, as really nicely done in this work by Laura Spittler. And you can show that the scattering is a factor of a thousand smaller than what we expected from this old screen model. Okay, and then you can try to say, well, you know, maybe it's not very likely, but maybe we still have this strong scattering screen that's in the way, but this magnetar just happens to be on a lucky patch through here that pierces through this screen. And so then Jeff Bauer did this excellent uh, work where you can then image the magnetar and show that its image is exactly the same as Sag A star. So the scattering that we thought was associated with this screen is in fact associated with this amount of scattering in time and does not prevent you from detecting pulsars in the galactic center. Okay, so the scattering, in my mind, people will dispute this statement, um, but I would say that scattering at this point, there's no good evidence that scattering can explain the lack of pulsar detections in the galactic center. Okay. So what Ryan and I did was then to revisit this question of how many pulsars you actually expect to see then in these radio surveys. So we made very simple estimates based on the number of young stars that you see, and, and then the, the population of pulsars and the sensitivity of surveys. So it's just showing two different surveys with their sensitivity given this new, what we now know about the scattering, and these are the known normal young radio pulsars in the galaxy. So you should have been sensitive to about half of these. You know that there's something like a few hundred young stars that will become neutron stars, and you can very conservatively estimate that you should have detected about 10 of these in previous surveys. And there's, there's other ways of doing this estimate, also, also simple, um, and they all sort of agree at this number of roughly about 10. And so, of course, then the chances that you randomly didn't detect any are very small. Okay, so I think the natural conclusion then is that these ordinary young bright pulsars like we see in the rest of the galaxy are missing in the central parsec for some reason. And Ryan and I call this the missing pulsar problem in the galactic center. Okay, the good news actually about the scattering. So the searches will continue. At some point, you really do expect to see pulsars. I mean, the great news about the scattering is that now you're actually more sensitive to millisecond pulsars than you thought before. So if millisecond pulsars are there, and we don't, you can see we can only barely maybe detect the brightest of these that are known. If they're there, then you should be able to actually see them with surveys in the relatively near future getting down into this range. And actually, for these GR-type tests, millisecond pulsars are the ones that you can uh, time the most precisely, uh, for instance, to do gravitational wave limits and stuff like that. And so you'd really like to find one of these on a good orbit anyway. Okay. But in the meantime, I think it's important that, that people start yeah, maybe thinking about this mystery. What is it about pulsar, about neutron star formation or evolution that's different in the central parsec of the galaxy than, yeah, the, than the field, say? And so I think there's a couple explanations that have been put forward or, or that we thought about. One of them is that there are a lot of young star clusters where you don't see any ordinary radio pulsars, and it's for the simple reason that you don't have stars that were suitable young pulsar progenitors that have gone supernova yet. And so if you had a huge gap in the star formation history in the galactic center, then maybe you could do this. Here's a plot of at least MP group's best estimate of the star formation rate, and you really need a huge gap in about this range, and maybe you start to get something. Maybe this helps a little bit, but I don't think probably it's not enough to explain the lack of detections. Okay, the other alternative is people have put forward is we suggested maybe you form magnetars instead. And you could also say maybe the high density of interactions among stars in the galactic center means that you form millisecond pulsars preferentially. So maybe even young pulsars can be spun up to become millisecond pulsars. It should be very promising for, for detecting them in orbits. And then there are more exotic suggestions about how maybe you can make neutron stars collapse by you know, creating dark matter or doing something uh, unknown types of matter. Okay, but, but either way, yeah, in, the, in the meantime, as the searches continue, uh, you know, if you have ideas about this, we would welcome extra, extra theoretical ideas for what, what is it about this, you know, you're, you're trying to form compact objects in a dense, magnetized, hot environment. And so what about that maybe could change something about, about how we get pulsars? Okay, and so thanks for your attention. Yeah, I agree. 
It's a good, right? It's a good mystery. I think the predictions that you should see a lot of these, and maybe even that they're on very promising orbits around the black hole. I think those were, yeah, that was the that was the natural idea, right? And so now I think it's time that we start taking seriously that at least the ordinary radio pulsars don't don't seem to be there in the numbers that we expect. I mean, at some level, I think they must be there, right? We're already, I don't know, we already have like sort of 90% too few. So if we go deeper, we should start to detect some, hopefully. But uh, yeah, I think it's time to start taking seriously that something else interesting is happening here with question would be on the observational evidence. So you said that angular broadening has been measured by Bauer, Jeff Bauer. Yeah. And that is that matches what Sagittarius A star shows. And then what you're saying, the time broadening is not seen. At least it's not as large as it should be because you're able to see the radio pulsar. It's the mismatch between these two that people have interpreted as saying there is no local scattering. Is that right? Yeah, so I think some people would call this a mismatch. I think so Jeff yeah. showed that, I mean, you know, if you assume it's a single thin scattering screen, as is the kind of the evidence for the frequency dependence of the image and stuff, then it's perfectly natural. It's just that the scattering takes place in some, you know, along the line of sight somewhere. So say within, you know, halfway the distance to the galactic center, but it, that it's not local. So there's no mismatch as long as you're fine with the scattering taking place yeah, somewhere yeah. else along the line of sight. You're not fine with that. It has to be local. But you think that local really is ruled out. I mean, yeah, it's... it's those, and those observations yeah. are solid. I mean, I haven't seen the data, so... Yeah, I mean, the, the amazing thing is, right, you wouldn't... It, you really wouldn't have detected anything, right? So it's being able to measure the scattering at all. There's no issues with how well you can measure the temporal broadening or any problem like that. You would not have been able to measure that at 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz if, if the old model were correct, so... producing stars, they eject a lot of mass. In principle, the neutron stars are preferentially born there. Could it be conceivable that the dispersion towards those neutron stars is higher than, say, randomly in the volume of the nuclear cluster? Yeah, so we've we thought about this a little bit that maybe, I mean, I don't know if this is where you're going with this, but that you could maybe, I don't know, like spin down neutron stars by accretion or interfere somehow with the pulsar mechanism by having, by having accretion from gas. But I just mean like increasing the column I think you would be able to detect them up to very high dispersion measures. So having extra gas there is not a problem as long as it doesn't actually prevent the pulse from being seen. So I mean, there's some suggestions if you accrete enough material that you can actually spin down a neutron star, and then, but that would require much higher density. So I mean, maybe that was the case in the past, but I don't think that would be a way to get rid of all of the young pulsars now. Yeah, I guess I would say that there's just, it's not that you couldn't decide to invoke lots of scattering that's providing a screen in the galactic center, right? We can't rule that out without observations of all other lines of sight. I think it's mostly that the thought before that you wouldn't see pulsars was based on the observed image of Sag J star and the idea that the scattering should be local. And there were some other arguments too. Um, but now you know that the angular broadening that we see towards Sag J star is associated with weak scattering in time that doesn't prevent you from detecting pulsars. So it's mostly that there's no, addition, there's no evidence now, I would say, that the scattering prevents you from detecting things, even though others would still say, oh, there's something complicated going on with the scattering. So, but I don't, I don't see the evidence for that. So. <laughs>